Hey, what's up, guys? Keith Thunderwood here, creator, writer, and producer of Khalifi and the Timeless Centuries. And we have Ms. Dana Guri A in the house. Yes, yes, yes. And you will know her from the upcoming Don't Look Deeper, P Valley, and the US versus Billie Holiday. And for you diehard fans, you'll also know her from yeah. Mr. Tarantino's movies, um, Hateful Eight, and then also Django Unchained, mm -hmm. and then also recently in Raising Dion. So you got a little superhero cred on, uh, um, under your belt, right? Yeah, I do. Raising Dion is definitely a, a superhero story, so, and I'm super proud of it. It was such a wonderful casting crew and production team. They were fabulous. That's great, Dana. You, you, your resume is extensive. Really? Yes. I can. know it's weird when I say really like that because people are like, come on, but I don't know. It's all surreal to me. It's real, but it's also like, I've been working at this for so long, Keith. You know, I've been, I had my first audition when I was 11 years old. So, you know, it's been a long time. And so I didn't become an official professional, uh, an official professional until I was like 30. And so mm. let me be careful I'm telling my age. Although you can Google it. So. Everybody has said that like the last <laughs> three chats I've done, everybody's like, oh, wait a minute, let me not date myself. <laughs> right, but you can Google it, so it's fine. And I'm proud of my age. Like, you know, uh, I, I earned my decade in the business thus far. And so Amen. when I do look at those credits, I'm really proud of them. And, and I'm, it, it still is like incredible that I've worked with so many exceptional actors and producers and writers you know yourself present company included well, well i'm very honored wow i mean you know i mean i know it but <laughs> 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 i know it but you know but i i received that thank you dana and i mean and, and then on the flip side of that i mean that says a lot about your talent not only your talent but you as a person, because people like to work with people that they can like. Yeah, like a book goes a long way. You know, if it's down to like you and two other actresses, I think a lot of times um, directors and producers have to ask themselves who don't want to spend three months with, mm -hmm. or months with or even a day with, like who has that likability factor, you know? That's true. That's yeah. true. Spread that and let them know, you know? That's true. That's right. Absolutely. Because how many times have you worked with Quentin Tarantino? Twice. Yes. Twice. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, like I said, that says a lot, a lot, a lot. As, so. as well as um, I worked with Lee Daniels now twice as well. Cause that's right. Billy Holiday is his project. And I was so happy to be on set with him again too. Right. Um, you know, I know we're jumping the gun a little bit, but I mean, you know, when you sent that over to me and I was just like, wow, this sounds really interesting. You know, the U S yeah. versus Billy Holiday. And, um, you know, tell us a little bit about that project and then, you know, a little bit about uh, Billy Holiday for, you know, those who might be listening that, you know, might not know. I've always been a huge Billy Holiday fan. Um, she, her voice, I mean, obviously she's an exceptional figure and icon in the black community and the jazz community at large. Uh, Audra Day is who's playing her, who I think nice. is her first role ever to my knowledge, and she knocked it out of the park. Um, I actually played her mom in the film. Nice. And um, it was written by Susan Lloyd Parks, which was a big draw for me because I'm a huge fan of her. I mean, I saw Top Dog Underdog on Broadway with Mo Staff and Jeffrey Wright. So clearly I was in love with her writing and her ability as a female black writer. And then, you know, you have Lee Daniels, who's, you know, at the helm. Uh, doing what Lee does, which is exceptional work. So it was really a pleasure to be a part of. And I, I'm, I'm actually really excited to see how it goes. I've, I've heard from um, one set of friends who know Lee, who's seen a first edit or something, and they said it was exceptional. So I'm like, wow. I'm really excited to see it. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't wait. It. I cannot wait. I mean, it just sounds, like I said, sounds so, so interesting. And then yeah. while we're there, tell me a little bit about Don't Look Deeper. Don't Look Deeper is Catherine Hardwick's, Hardwick, Hardwick's project, sorry. <laughs> um, Catherine is wonderful. She first, um, she's 
widely known for having directed the first Twilight film um, and a, a number of other really incredible films. Uh, she started out in her career as a production designer and then transitioned to direction. And mm. Catherine is wonderful. Being on her set is like, it's just sort of just easy breezy. It's just real like very chill, you know? And she's such a cool lady. Um, very, very, very intelligent, very creative. And I played uh, the school teacher to the lead in Quibi's um, Don't Look Deeper. And the interesting thing about Quibi is it's all short, short form content. So um, not, I don't, I think it's eight minutes is their longest right. episode. Each episode is eight minutes. Right. And so uh, being a part of that, it was interesting because it, was a, it wasn't different the way we shot, but it was a little bit different um, because it is short form content and it, it feels like you're shooting a film but right. it's, it's episodic, so it was really, and everybody, again, was great. They're all young and beautiful, and then it was just me, and I was just like, and I'm, I'm young. And, and you beautiful. are young and beautiful, too. I'm young-ish. That's I'm right. Young you know what I mean? Day, no, I'm, a, I'm not bad. I do good. I do right. well. <laughs> but um, these young actors, they were, like, in their early 20s, and they're, like, gorgeous, Keith, and I was just like, what? What am I doing here? <laughs> I'm the teacher, well, right? Right, right. Well, well. Speaking of the the beautiful people, we're gonna uh, P Valley. What's up, oh with P Valley? Goodness. Come on. So okay. <laughs> first of all, right. First of all, Katori Hall is a genius. Okay. And she's been a genius. Like Katori and I met in Kigali, Rwanda. Um, mm. on a trip through my graduate work, my alma mater, which is CalArts. She was at, um, she had met our department head, Eric N., uh, who eventually transitioned to Brown University and decided to come on the trip. So that's how we met. It was an arts and healing, um, you know, philanthropy. Uh, our school built a library at the university in Kigali. So we had this sort of adjunct bridged um, program where some students would come over to CalArts and then CalArts students would come over to the university there. And we didn't just stop there. We went to Kigali, Rwanda, and we also went to Kampala, Uganda, which is ironically where I pointed out a gentleman on a TV screen who was on a sketch comedy commercial. And I said, girl, he's cute. And she was like, girl, <laughs> he's like, oh, and uh, she said, but no, he lives in Kampala. I was like, look, you never know. She married him some years later and they nice. have three beautiful boys. Right. You um, called that one, Dana. Say again? You called that one. I did. I, yes, I, you I, did. I'm pretty good at it. I'm a decent matchmaker for the most part. Okay. You know? But needless to say, I'm digressing. Uh, we, Katori and I met there. Um, uh, we met then back in 2008. And I just watched her star rise. I went to see The Mountaintop on Broadway, um, mm. which was exquisitely uh, written. I mean, it was so beautiful. And to see Angela Bassett, who I'd worked with on American Horror Story. Right. Um, on the Coven season. And then yes. to also see mm -hmm. Sam Jackson, who I'd worked with at that point on Django Unchained, or I was about to. I can't remember which year it was. I'm, I'm flip-flopping. But to see these people that are these, you know, megastars that I'd actually either had worked with or was about to work with or is going to work with again. Right. Uh, it was pretty incredible. And uh, Katori is just, you know, she's an award-winning writer. And so her new scripted series on Star, P-Valley, um, is no different. It's, it's exceptional work. Uh, I was extremely afraid to accept the role. It was just an offer mm -hmm. um, because she said she wrote it for me. Nice. And I was really afraid to... Uh, go as far as I did at that point in my career and not push past those boundaries. Mm. Um, I'd never done anything having anything to do with nudity. Right. And, and while I wasn't nude, the girls that were playing um, <clears throat> uh, Miss Mississippi and Gidget uh, were, and, and it was a gradual process where they, you pay for, you're getting what you pay for, which is to see more and more of them nude. Right. Um, the purpose of being in a patron in a strip club. Right. And so I was really afraid. And those girls were so sweet. They were so, they were grateful to me too, because like mm -hmm. I, I had to speak up and say things that I was comfortable with, with what, what I wasn't. But I knew, 
I wanted to deliver what was being um, required of me in the script. And I wanted to deliver and make Katori happy with what she wrote and me bringing that to life and giving that character a voice. And honestly, you know, Brandy, Brandy Evans, uh, uh, Nico, Alarica, literally one of the kindest casts I've worked with. Like no airs, really sweet, open. Literally Brandy would be like, did you see that last take? What did you think? And then she would ask for my like feedback and I nice. absolutely went her gladly and humbly. We ran lines together. Like this was like a crew of people that were really loving and in it together, like an actual true family. And we had a blast. I had a blast shooting. I went far, I stretched, I sang, I was ridiculous. I was drunk the whole time. Not literally, but you know, right, right. figuratively. And it was um, all of my fears prior to because of the unknown, because I didn't know any better. I didn't know what I was walking into and what it would be. Right. Or it was they dissipated immediately the moment I met people. Like from the moment I met Gita Patel, who was our director of that particular episode, she was so wonderful. You know, and then of course you had Katori right there on set, and it was just like, girl, you good? You all right? You happy? Yes. You know right. what I mean? Right. Just, it's just okay. Like, you okay? You okay? Like, you okay? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it was that was uh, P Valley was actually a beautiful experience. So, and I would go back if they asked me back in a nanosecond. Nice. So, Dana, I didn't know you could sing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now you know, you know, you know, you know what I'm getting ready to ask. I'm not going to sing, Keith. I'm okay. not doing okay. it. Why are you trying to make me put Can like, I just, can I just do that? The minute you walked through the door. Oh, no. Stop. No, I can't <laughs> sing anymore. I could tell you what a am at. No, stop, stop. No. Okay, all right. I'm just, I'm just playing around. No, I, uh. But I, I can hear it, though. I can hear it. Yeah, I have one of those um, mezzo-soprano voices, but I also have like tenor notes too. Yes. And I don't like broadcast. You have some range. You have yeah, some I don't range. Love the range. Right. I don't like broadcast that I can sing, although my mama and all my friends would be like, that's like one of your strongest suits. You know, it is also the thing that uh, it is harrowing to sing in front of people, actually. Right. Well, like, put on the spot. Since you know, you I was just playing around just now. It's not for real. Yeah, but, but I did. It, it sounded for real. Thank you, dear. I appreciate yes. it. Yes. I did sing the national anthem at a Saints game when the Saints uh, played the Cardinals. I think it was in 27, 2014, maybe? Mm -hmm. Several years ago. That's the largest crowd I've ever sang in front of. That was 80,000 people. And it was. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of bodies. It's a lot of souls to just have looking at you. It's different when you're on a TV show or you're in a film. You're not mm -hmm. there with them when they're receiving your work. Right, Lies immediately. Right then and there, it's like they can see right through you if you, uh, if you bring anything unreal. Now, again, I'm going to act like I don't know. Since you mentioned the Saints, is there, <laughs> is there, some, con is there some connection there? Well, of course, I am born and raised from New Orleans. So, yeah. All right, NOLA in the house. Yeah, I'm a NOLA baby. That <laughs> yes. is right. Yeah, born and raised. Um, and like six generations back as well on both of my parents' sides. So, um, you know, uh, we, we are a long line of folks from the great state of Louisiana. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're a, a unique um, culture of people very very special culture of people and i rep my city very yes like, yes well you I'm, know i got folks oh, in too, we so. bleed black and gold like i am a new orleanian girl i'm from new orleans yeah yes it's it's a great place like i said i've got family there too and if um you know i hadn't got outside today and got my little nice summer tan you know me and Dana, we look a little bit like cousins. So <laughs> 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 but um, so where was your favorite place to go visit when you were growing up? Where where'd you like to go when you were growing up? Honestly, um, my grandmother's, my late grandmother who just passed away in June. She passed away on her birthday. Oh, my, my sympathies, yeah. Really, and yeah, she's she was ninety six. She's a brilliant lady. Great. She was ready. She went on her birthday. Who who do you know that goes out the day that they came in? So Dude, that's very, it. very special. Um, yes. I really enjoyed spending time at her home 
because as kids, we spent a lot of time there uh, because, you know, both my parents worked. And so after school, we'd be there. Or if my grandmother ever had to catch my mom's back, you know, mm. like if one of us got sick or whatever. And it was always just a lot of fun. They were, um, they were business owners. And as Black people back then, also people who had not finished, like my, my grandma, my grandfather never finished. Uh, six, he finished sixth grade. And to, you know, become an entrepreneur that he, become the um, entrepreneur that he was, was pretty inspiring. They had two businesses and I used to kind of like hang out with them on the weekends. And, you know, there was uh, Tom's One Hour Cleaners as well as a laundromat that they owned. And so I would either be helping him count quarters or I would check people out and take their ticket and like, you know, press the button and see their clothes come on and ring them up. I, I had done that as young as nine. Nice. So, yeah. So I, uh, one of my favorite places uh, in, in general is to just be with my family and friends. There is a place in the city moving away and then coming back to New Orleans. Uh, Cause I moved back to New Orleans in 2010 after I finished at CalArts. Um, and I had done New York prior to that. So it's kind of like living this really nomadic life in, uh, in my 20s. Right. And in 2010, I moved back to New Orleans with the sole goal to be on HBO Streaming. And I was like, there's no way they're going to make a show about my city post-Katrina and I'm not on it. I was like, That's I'm right. going to be on it. So, and I was. I ended up doing a little two-episode arc with Ken, Candy Alexander who was incredible to work with, you know, David Simon, uh, Eric Overmeyer, those folks. Um, it was really, uh, uh, Wendell Pierce. It was a great experience. Um, so I moved back to New Orleans in 2010 and it was then that I kind of fell in love with the city in a different kind of way. Mm. City Park has a line of parallel oak trees right grow so big that their branches connect over the street and they're on both sides of the median or, or as we call it in new orleans the neutral ground um, yep, because yep. the ground is neutral it's that's between right this and that one so the neutral ground and i swear to god like not to be esoteric or too like you know um new agey when it's you walk good. between those oak trees keith it's mm -hmm. you can feel an energy like unlike anything it's like you know these trees are not only as old as the city, but they're some of the oldest in the country. Right. And likely in North America. So it's just, it's a really special energy and it's a real special vibe. Mm -hmm. And oak trees particularly have a heinous connection with black people um, mm. as so many black lives were taken because they were hung from trees. But, right. but I believe, I don't believe, I know historically, we also drew a lot of our energy and memories and community under oak trees as well. And so anyway, there, there is a place in city park in the back of the park that I just, every single time I'm in New Orleans, I have to go there. And it's almost like plugging in and I just recharge. So right. that's the long winded answer. No, but it's, no, it's all, I love talking about New Orleans. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's such a magical place. It is. I mean, it, it really is. And it's hard not to talk about the magical aspects of it or the magical connection, yeah. you know, um, to it. It's a great place. It's a great city. Yes. So were you one of those actors, Dana, that played make-believe as a kid? And if so, what were your favorite make-believe characters? I don't know that I have, uh, okay, well, okay. Uh, yes, sure. I mean, of course, right? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, would daydream all the time. I still daydream. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, my, I'm trying to monetize my daydreaming and create, you know, ideas and pitches and story plot lines, et cetera. Absolutely. Uh, but my mind was always like adrift and, you know, in the clouds and in the stars and creatively 
thinking of some way to entertain myself. And it wasn't that I was a kid that was alone. I had my two brothers. They were nuts. You know what I mean? Right. And what I mean by that is they're just boys and they're crazy. You know what I mean? Right. And it was like a really fun house. It was a very musically charged house. Like we, like there was music every evening and definitely on the weekends. Right. And like, you know, all the old good stuff. You know That's what I mean? Right. And my dad was, um, <clears throat> he was an air personality. So he would DJ and send requests to my mom or shout outs to my mom. And it was all just amazing artists. So I grew up with a lot of music and creativity and their instruments in the house. And so there was lots of entertainment, but I would still find myself daydreaming or mm. creating stories with my dolls or nice. um, make believe characters. Uh, I, I don't know when it happened, but I think later in my teens i became sort of obsessed with period pieces mm. um and the garb and costuming of like you know turn of the century dresses and gowns and so i would put on like a long skirt and walk around the house like i was in like a bustle skirt or something you know nice it's cool stuff you know right fun stuff you know? but those are you know those are, are are very very precious memories you know that i think that um as an actor that people look at normally on a screen, you know, mm -hmm. that they get to understand that there is a person behind, you know, what they see on the screen. So I love those stories. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what was the most important life lesson that you learned growing up that you still apply to your life today? Um, <laughs> my dad still to this day says to me, uh, Nike philosophy and it's been since I was a kid uh, and and even before he coined the phrase Nike philosophy uh, you know it just basically means just do it mm -hmm. um, they always taught me and instilled in me that there was nothing I couldn't do or to put that in a positive way I could do anything I just had to put my focus in and just put my mind to it not to sound you know cliche but literally that's what they taught me that's the backbone of who i am and so i had one parent my father who would say you can do anything like he would say it so emphatically and the reason why he would say it so emphatically is because he really truly believed it like he believed mm. he could do anything you know and this is a man who drank from colored fountains yes so his his father my father's father my grandfather uh, I think did two tours in World War II and both times he was a cook, you know, they wouldn't let wow. him actually fight. Right. So to have that scope and perspective, you know, and to have it instilled in you, instilled in you in such a young age. So yeah, I had one parent uh, was extraordinary. And I had one parent telling me, you know, you can do anything. And then I had the other parent, my mother, who's much more logical and practical mm. telling me how to do it. Okay, right. yeah, you can do anything, but this is how you do this and this. You know what I mean? She was that's, real like that's what yeah, mothers do, like, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's your dad that's like, you can do it all. Let's dream big, you know? And then she mom was like, Okay, well, hold on, let's figure out how we're gonna do it and then, you know. Make it happen. Make it happen. Dad, so, just do it, mom, it make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. That's great. Um, that's great balance. Mm -hmm. um, which one of your roles um, do you feel was the most pivotal in your career and why? You know, it's so funny. I was thinking about this the other day. Um, that's tough. You know why, Keith? Because every single role I've had, even from the very beginning, the first thing I've ever done, which was a cafeteria worker. Mm -hmm. it's the job that Taft Hartley me into the union because it was an under five, it was five lines. And right. So officially become a part of SAG because of right. it. that was, I would say, a pivotal role. Cora from Django Unchained was a pivotal role. Um, Minnie from Hateful Eight was a pivotal role. Um, Sharon Davis, Davison from um, Jack, uh, Jeff Nichols' uh, Midnight Special playing the um, child counselor. That was a pivotal role. Um, so it's hard to, P Valley was, was huge. Like I'd never pushed past my, pushed past my boundaries like that. Right. Um, I will tell you uh, 
I will tell you though, one of the most challenging roles I've ever had to play, which I believe is synonymous with it being pivotal because I was absolutely different on the other side of it. And that was playing the role of a Rwandan nun, mm. Maria Kizito, uh, who aided in the death of some 5,000 people. She was with the RPF during the Rwandan genocide. And she was bringing people in, telling them, you have refuge at the Christian ministries at the Catholic facilities, and you can stay here, we'll feed you, you know. And they ended up murdering all those people, and she had a hand in it. And I, as an actor, did not know how to, I didn't even think of her as a villain. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even get into her mind in a way that would classify her or identify her as something. Because she seemed like a normal human being that was a practicing nun, an active nun at mass every morning and like in the afternoons and evenings would help murder people. And so it's not even like, like how do you unlock that? And then I did research upon research upon research and I found this one testimony about her and the leader of the RPF who was there with her on the site. And the quote was, they were inseparable. They were like husband and wife. And when I read that and I combined that with the research that I had done, which was that she joined the nunnery when she was like 17, 18 years old, it occurred to me, oh, oh, she thought she was doing this for love. Mm. She was in love with him and did anything that he needed or requested. I don't think this was a political thing for her. Or she might have said it was. Right. But the real truth is she wanted to please this man and she did feel like the wife to his cause. And so once I had my sort of like cracked door, unlocked door, that's what I held on to, to make it make sense to me and also to um, defend the choices that the character was making. Because otherwise, how can you do that? I'm a, I'm, you know, a practicing Catholic myself. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know all about Hail Marys and Our Fathers. And to have to say them inside of the, you know, bubble of a play um, spoken by a person who's literally murdering people mm. and using the prayer as an excuse or the, wow. as, you know, the crux positioning as to what the why. It, it was a trip. I was definitely different after that piece. Um, my spiritual life was different. Like everything mm. about how I approached my work was different and how I protect myself, you know, not only from other personalities, but from like the, from the character itself. I truly believe they get in us and I truly believe you can get lost. Mm. I mean, we've seen it happen. Oh yeah. With so many really incredible actors. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm on those levels, but I'm by, but I am saying that I've experienced my own sort of like, uh, uh, Journey I have my own the plan to have to put it down after, you know, right. have my own little rituals and, you know, things that I do to ensure that it goes and doesn't stay, you know? Right. It's, it's funny because I, you know, we know each other, but when we were doing the introduction, I was just so into everything that you've done. I <laughs> forgot to mention what you did for me. <laughs> Which, right. I, you know, I was sitting here right. and I was thinking, and I'm thinking about my questions and I was getting ready to move on to the next one. I was like, well, I haven't even told what Dana's <laughs> involvement is with the project, you know? So yeah. you were the voice of Califia in Califia and the Timeless Centuries and did a phenomenal job. Really? I mean, Yes, she did. I mean, it's just, we've, we've just, you know, we've, we've shown three episodes so far. There's one more. Yeah. That's, that's the tour de farce right there, you know, for a motion comic, but it's, right. it, um, you know, they've gotten hints so far, you know, and it's just been very impactful and I'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. But what do you think that you have most in common with Califia? Uh, uh, I would say off the top of my head, easily her strength and confidence. Mm. Um, I don't profess to be the most confident person in the room. 
In fact, I have just as many, if not more insecurities than everybody else. Um, but I think the difference is, is that I've taken a long, hard look at myself over the years. I practice therapy. I mean, I, I you know, I pursue therapy. Uh, I believe in behavioral sciences and like a healthy mind. And so when my insecurities creep up, um, I recognize them. I see what it is. I own it. And then I let, I let it flow just like any other emotion or trigger. And so I think that has instilled my confidence along with being rejected so much in my life. Mm. Like when you're an actor, you're literally in a constant state of being rejected for any myriad of reasons. It could be your eye color, your hair's too short. She's too big, she's too small, she's too brown, she's not brown enough. She was funny, but it wasn't like, you know, the kind of funny we want. She's cute, but she's not really cute enough. She's really sexy, but mm, she's too big the list goes on. And when you're under that kind of scrutiny, you have a decision to make. You're either going to let it take you under and believe all of the BS that they say, or you're going to make decisions about yourself, your person, your aesthetic, your style, your energy, you know, your spirit's bigger and better than all of those opinions. And so I think my confidence comes from being knocked down so many times. And that is what is in common most with Califia and her strength. The strength is a byproduct of, having had to get up off the ground so many times mm. you know that's, that's that's really good yeah that's what i think anyway that's yeah, what our no, connection is you know i would definitely um agree with that and again i think um viewers will see more of that in the um the last episode mm -hmm. that um you know that she is a character you know that has flaws or that has made mistakes that's mm -hmm. i think that's a better way to say it yeah. And, you know, and, and it's still okay to have some reservations about certain things or to be a little, you know, untrusting. But mm -hmm. then the point is finding that strength and that confidence mm -hmm. coming from those experiences. So, yeah, yeah. Not, I think you, I think you were definitely, you know, there with how, you know, I saw your connection to the character as well. Yeah. I, everybody, um, and I don't know if this is necessarily in line with her, but it doesn't matter how many times I've been hurt, and specifically by men. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, I have worked my life to not bring my baggage mm -hmm. or my trauma from what someone else has done into my new relationship with someone else or make That's them right. pay for it. It happens sometimes you know, it rears its ugly head. But for the most part, I keep a real big divider because I dealt with that. I, had, I, I healed from that. It's, it's in the past. And so with that said, everybody with me gets an A plus. It's just like teachers. Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the semester, everybody's got an A. And unless you prove to me you don't deserve an A, like you're going to keep your A. That's, That's how right. I treat other souls. Like I know a lot of people in my life that do the reverse it's like you have to prove to them who you are what you're about and i'm not even mad at that like i understand that perspective too that kind of hardwiring as well but for me it's just easier for the way my spirit works and the way my personality is is to just be like hey how you doing what's going on tell me mm -hmm. how you feel you know what I mean? it's like let me greet you with love and we'll go from there you know That's unless right. you prove otherwise to me unless you prove you're untrustworthy i'm gonna trust you mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, I, I mean, I may not know you, so I'm going to trust you to, to only a certain extent, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to treat you, you know what I mean? I'm not going to treat individuals that I don't know, like, as if they're out to get me, just because there have been people who not only were out to get me, but did get me, you know? Right. You know, it's, it's funny because I, um, I don't, you, reruns of Bewitch, and there was uh, the Queen Witch, and she used to give demerits. <laughs> you know, she, one demerit, two demerits. Yeah. And, and so, you know, see, we're family because yeah. I'm the same way. I'm like, you know, you start off with all, you know, all of your pieces, but then, you know, you, you whittle those pieces down. And, so, yeah. and, and that's how I operate with people as well. And I think that's a good way to be. Like you said, we have to have yeah. some reservations, you know. Yeah, you have to protect people. yourself. You can't be silly. That's but right. Know, you know, I believe there is infinitely more good in the world than there is bad, despite yeah, 
the current climate, despite the boldness of people, despite mm. um, everybody's need for attention and how narcissism is run rampant. Um, despite all these negative things, I still inherently believe that there's more good than bad. That's beautiful. That's that's because you. you're a good person. So thanks, boo. You, you're welcome. You're welcome. There you go. Uh huh. Uh huh. There. Yes. <laughs> you're so silly. Yeah, I it's, can't it's, believe it's, you got me to sing. I'm so embarrassed. No, it's all good. This 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 is casual. It's fun. We know each yeah. other. So I mean, so it's that's all good. Yeah. We just we're just sharing. We're just sharing with them. And yeah. so um, you know. I mentioned earlier about um, your voice and what you brought to Califia. And man, I tell you, from the, I have heard from so many people that voice, that opening monologue, you know, and they just, and you know, we, we're really clandestine with Califia in the story. But whenever they hear that voice, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to hear that voice. I kid you not. Yeah. You know, I, I have had animator friends that have said that to me. That's and awesome. so Thank where you. did you, how did you find it? How did you find that voice for Califia? I mean, honestly, I found it through you, through your writing. The Ooh, writing you. tells me what to do and informs my body. My voice is just an instrument of my body, you know. Mm. Um, and so reading your work and understanding who she was. And I played with some different sounds and different takes. She didn't strike me as the type of woman, though, who was in her sort of nasal uh, resonance or even in the crown. Uh, to me, she spoke from her uterus. She spoke mm. from her ovary. She spoke mm. from her femininity and her true power. Yes. So a lot of that was deep diaphragmatic breathing. A lot of that was, you know, uh, finding a low tone, not intentionally pushing low, of course not, but grounded mm. there i didn't think there would be anything flighty sounding about her voice right she's a warrior with That's the word right. warrior you know there comes so many indicators and to me the the um resonance of her voice was one of them you know so yeah nice. and yeah. this is purely you know opinion um, Califia, like I was saying earlier, clandestine, very much so in the shadows. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that she's written, you know, that way to be in the shadows? Um, she doesn't, Califia to me is not the type of woman that is fame seeking, if you will, mm -hmm. or attention seeking. She's about her work, her business. She's about her goals, objectives, and protecting who she needs to protect and stopping dead in their tracks who she needs to stop. And then she carries on, you know. Um, I wonder, too, I was going to talk to you about this. Um, I wonder how much of her had even a desire to have to, to be this warrior. Sometimes in life you feel a calling and it's not always in alignment or with the grain of what you may have particularly wanted for yourself. You know, a lot of times people are like, well, you chose this life when they talk about acting if I've complained in the least little way, which I try not to complain. But being an actor is really hard. They think right. it's, a, it's not, it's a mental game. It's a real chess game. And so when people say to me, well, you chose this life, I always retort and say, no, it chose me. That's a big mm. difference. That's There's right. like a calling that I had and it's been since I was a kid and I've not always wanted to do it. It's like, it's kind of the difference between folks who are in certain specific facets of the game of entertainment, like under that umbrella, merely for fame seeking, re seeking reasons, merely for the money. Mm -hmm. You know, I have no desire to be famous. I will tell anybody that. That's not my jam. My jam is being on a set mm -hmm. and waking up artistry, like yes. being creative. And so what, I, to, to, what I'm saying in a roundabout way about Califia is that's how she feels to me. I don't need to be in the limelight. In the shadows is where I can live until I need to do what needs to be done. Right. And what I am actually called to do. That's that's really good, you know, Dana. That you um, that you picked up on that with the character, 
-hmm. because it's it's interesting in the original work from the the 1400s and i reference this a lot she was that woman originally you know she was naive she was a young queen you know and yeah. bored and you know she wanted to get out and see the world and conquer you know countries and the whole bit mm -hmm. but without unless you've read the story i mean other people you know, without telling a lot, um, you know, she faces some defeats and some heartaches. Absolutely. You, you know, yeah. and so from that, and you know, it's it's a it's it's a true growing process for all of us. You know, yeah. we we do grow, we do change, we do evolve as humans, and so I had to ask myself from where the story ended, mm -hmm. you know, what would be the effects on a person you know coming out of that yeah you know and so that was my thought process when i got but but yes i would agree you know and that that, that those kinds of experiences can make you unselfish they can make you be about the work that's right you know and not having to have the glory when you when you realize it was all superficial you know to begin uh -huh. with yeah so, so that was good Dana. Especially when a character like Califia was born, she was born to mm -hmm. do something. Yes. But that's not to say her thoughts and inner feelings didn't explore the idea of living a normal existence mm -hmm. or falling in love, you know, and doing what people do when they fall in love. I, I've noticed that most of the greatest people in life, the real game changers, like folks that have like put a stamp on either culture or history or uh, any, you know, an array of things, um, they tend to live a life of solitude. Mm -hmm. They tend to be dedicated to the calling and what it was their purpose is or was. And that's it. That's right. Um, and I, I always find those stories so fascinating. And I always find those um, individuals um, uh, brave, really, really brave. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's not true easy. bravery. It's not easy. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Oh my God. Like isolating yourself and doing stuff that makes no sense to anyone or you know, in Califia's case, having to exercise real power and violence on occasion and put down her foot and know what law is, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, um, yeah, like we mentioned earlier, she's really strong and she's really confident. Mm -hmm. That's you know? right. Um, you, along with a bunch of great actors and, you know, working actors that were so gracious enough to lend your voices to a proof of concept good project. Group. I am you so good flattered. Group. I am you so did. flattered. And, and, and wait a minute, I wanted to make sure that I did my part, that that experience was as professional oh. as possible, you know, I, I'm studio. Not, you know. I'm not gonna lie to you. I, when we, when it was all said and done, I, was kind of like okay well when is it happening again because i mm. loved this uh, yeah everything okay. from the folks who ran the studio to yeah. your producers to your engineers that are in the room to your to the fellow actors like everyone was exceptional there aaron i just could like aaron fitzgerald shout out she yeah. i could listen to her all day long i was literally telling my partner just yesterday about this interview and everything and i said to him I said, babe, you don't understand because we were going through the IMDb list of all of us mm -hmm. on there. I was like, this woman, she can do like 80,000 voices. She's so immensely talented. And everybody was. Everybody, yeah. you had a strong, strong crew in there. So I was really proud to be a part of it. Thank and you. I, thought you, I thought you did an exceptional job, you know, spearheading us all. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. We we have gone down a litany list of everything that you've done. Is there anything else that you're working on or that's coming up that you want to let everybody know about? Um, well, P Valley is released. Mm -hmm. The only thing that is not released is what we discussed earlier, which is U.S. versus Billy Holiday. I'm on God's good humor. I've been still putting really good work out into the world or work I believe in out into the world. Mm -hmm. 
and we'll see if some we get some bites we catch some fish we'll see how it goes okay um, but yeah uh it's 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 been hard in a pandemic um but i am still proud that i had work released during and there's work still yet to come mm. and i'm still putting myself out there every day all the time i do a lot of voiceover auditioning yes projects etc so yeah one step at a time that's great okay so my last official question is okay. if Kalithia could give any advice about courage what do you think it would be i don't know why this comes to mind but the phrase face the fire walk through the fire um is the first thing that popped up and you know they talk about people who are baptized by water are baptized by mm. fire and what i mean by that is sometimes you have to take the hardest step the most challenging step the um most complicated move forward in order to get through um and that's the kind of warrior she is so in regards to courage excuse my language she wouldn't pussyfoot around and do mm. something that would be weak mm -hmm. she could say go through the fire mm. you, you'll be baptized and better for it on the other side you know because the only way you know the only way to the other side is through can't you can't fake it in life. You can't go around or under. And I feel like when you try to do that too much in life, you end up missing the point, which is the journey and the lesson. You know, I think on the other side, the only way to get there is through, as it relates to having or needing the courage to complete anything. It could be a task of kicking um, a small addiction. It could be the task of completing a work. It could be the task of um, growing a baby. It could be the task of, uh, you know, dealing with an irritable coworker, you know, and having to have conversations we don't want to have or with our spouse or with whomever. Mm -hmm. But any kind of thing that ails you or is, is a, trouble, a trouble point in your life, I believe that you just got to go through the fire. The only way, the only way through the other, to the other side is through. So just go through it. Face it. You know, I feel like that's what would be her position on courage. She wouldn't, she wouldn't like debate on how she was going to like unsheath her sword. She wouldn't, you know, figure out how she was going to, you know, joust. Mm. Khalifia would pull out her sword and go to work. That's right. So I think that's the kind of courage she's about, you know. Dan, Dana Gurrier over there evoking Khalifia. <laughs> manifesting you know and come on y'all we gonna make it through we yes, have to that's right we that's gonna right. make it through <laughs> nice dana let me tell you this i have had we haven't talked well i mean we have talked but we haven't like talked yeah in a while this was so good and it was so yeah. much fun and insightful yeah. and just thank you so so much i appreciate you thank you it's always good to see you keith it's always good to hear from you hon nice. and whenever you need me i will i will be there i appreciate that so yeah. where can everybody find you miss gorier oh um you know it's just my name it's um all my handles are my name i'm on all of the social medias i mean i have my own opinion about social media <laughs> and the culture in which it's going in direction but neither here nor there i'm still a part of it that world and it's just my name, Dana, D-A-N-A Gurrier, G-O-U-R-R-I-E-R. -R -R -E it's just my full name on Twitter, Instagram. I think I still have Facebook. I don't really deal with Facebook so much. And then also TikTok. Nice. I don't post anything on TikTok. I, I, wait a minute. I thought I, I, thought I, thought I was going to see you breaking it down, you know, doing no, that. No. <laughs> Some, no. I'm telling you, I should, right? Oh, yeah, I was waiting. I was waiting for it. No. <laughs> I'm the worst at that kind of stuff, Keith. Like, I can move. I can dance. Oh, but oh, I know you can. People are doing I'm just like, how do they do that? Right. <laughs> so, but I am on it. But all those, the main, um, the main platform I use is Instagram. So Nice. Yeah. And all Twitter. Right. Well, you guys be sure to check out Dana Gurrier across all social media platforms at Dana Gurrier and be sure to follow us, continue to follow, share, and like at Califia Comics. 
again, Dana, thank you so much. I appreciate you. And um, we'll be talking soon. Thank you so much, Keith. It was absolutely a pleasure. Nice. All right. I'll talk to you soon.